So can everyone please welcome to the stage the wonderful Alex Fleming. Woo! Thanks, Dad. Yeah. Uh, seriously, though, it is actually my dad, so... <laughs> you weren't me, he'd do it. Um, so, as Jane said, my name's Alex. Um, I am an environmental scientist, and today I'm going to talk to you about Japanese nutweed. Yay! Yay! Yeah, those are my work Yay. colleagues, because they hear about me talk about this all the time. So Japanese knotweed, if you don't know, and you will know after my talk, is a very invasive, non-native plant species. So, like I said, I talk about Japanese knotweed all the time. I work in an engineering company with a lot of engineers who like to design roads and flood schemes, and they like to build structures with concrete. And Japanese knotweed is not a friend of concrete, so I end up trying to warn them about all the impacts of this, and I tell them again and again. But the problem is I also talk about Japanese knotweed then in my personal life because it's now infected my brain. So all my friends and family know about Japanese knotweed and I talk about it all the time. And it affects me to the point where I'm in my car and I see it in the hedgerows. I go for a walk and I see it on a river. I'm on Instagram and I see it. Like I'm not joking, a friend of mine had a beautiful picture up. He and his mom, they were having a barbecue in their back garden and all I could see all I could see was a massive bush of Japanese knotweed standing behind it. I was like, oh, I haven't told them. I will at some point, but I haven't. So it, it's ruined me. And it's also created a bit of mocking. So in work, strangers call me up. Colleagues call me up, okay? I've never met them, but they ring me up and they say, I think I have Japanese knotweed. Because I've probably given them my 45-minute lecture where I scaremonger them into Japanese knotweed. I tell them all the worst things. And believe me, there's lots of really bad things. It's all bad news, actually, uh, about, uh, about Japanese knotweed. And then or else I get emails, and it's usually capital letters in the subject line, is this Japanese knotweed? So I don't know if you guys at work, do you share photos of maybe pets, or like a wedding, or like an event that you went to? I get photographs of Japanese knotweed. Now, like 50% of the time, it's from their site. It's from, you know, an actual place of work. But the other side is from their neighbor's garden, their aunt's garden, their mother's their garden, you know? And they're trying to wonder, is this Japanese knotweed? Is their grandmother going to have to move out of her house in 20 years because it's growing up through the floors? And they want to know right now. And what can they do about it? So I am always the bearer of bad news. And sometimes I just give a response like, I, you have to send me another photo. I can't, I can't tell from that photo. So as I said, it's always bad news. And so it kind of became this running joke between friends that it's the apocalypse. <laughs> and Japanese knotweed is kind of the apocalypse. And it really um, lends itself very, very well to this idea. So, Japanese knotweed is the kind of plant that the Daily Mail loves, okay? They can make this so dramatic, you know, they can talk about houses having to be knocked down, and some are, you know, this is scaremongering, but like I said, it gets your attention. It's, you know, it's click, it's absolutely clickbait, sorry. Um, it's absolutely clickbait. So, you know, this kind of thing happens. And so it got me thinking that Japanese knotweed could be a fantastic movie, like an apocalyptic movie where, you know, the plant takes over the world. Now, the rate that it takes over the world is going to be slow enough, but it would be fantastic, okay? There's so many plot twists, there's so many bad things happening um, that I really think I could sell it. So that's how I'm going to sell it to you. So every good apocalyptic movie has a backstory. And the backstory with Japanese Naoi is like every good backstory in an apocalypse, is that we've brought the trouble upon ourselves. So back in the 19th century, when all these botanists in, in the UK, I'm going to blame them, okay? Um, they went out and they found this Japanese knotweed, guess where? J Japan, yeah. On volcanic, <laughs> volcanic slopes in Japan, where it doesn't take over. And they brought it to England and it was a rave. Like it was the thing to have in your garden. Everybody wanted it. All the nurseries were growing it everywhere. It was the thing, it was just, it was the plant of the year at the equivalent of the Chelsea, Chelsea Fire Show, shall we say. Okay, and then, and then they, saw, oh, then they started planting it on roadsides and on the banks of trains um, where the train tracks were because it was got this great root system, I'll tell you more later, but a great root system that keeps the soil there. And then, then they started to notice that, you know, they went back five years later and that one little plant that they planted has now spanned maybe like a hundred meter stretch and it's taking over and they've got to keep cutting it back for some, some reason. So that's the Baxter, we, we put it upon ourselves and we make it, we make it worse as well. So, how Japanese knotweed is going to take over the world? Okay, so first thing is first, 
is an extremely smart plant. You have to give it credit, okay? You, you really do. I, in the persistence of this plant is unbelievable. You just can't take it for granted. So in the winter time, you won't see it, okay? It's probably my happy time because I don't see it. <laughs> um, it dies back completely. It just looks like these empty canes, you know, these tall empty canes, like hollow, um, like bamboo or something, okay? And you think it's great. It's dead. It's gone. No, it's not. Okay? <laughs> the brains of the operation is the root system, or the rhizome for my, my fellow botanists and my environmental scientists, okay? And that's where, that's where it all happens. So then in March, it decides it's been, you know, it's, hand it's been hibernating, and in March it starts to shoot up. And it's just these really cute little red buds. You might even think it's like dock leaves, because guess what? It's related to the dock, okay? Docks, docks are just so friendly compared to this. And then it grows, and it grows. And I have these scary photos in work, and we like to show people, like, here's a photo in April. And isn't it lovely? It's like, it's up to my knee, you know? And it's, and it's springing out of a wall. And, and then a month, maybe two later, it's up to my head and you can't get past it at all because it can grow, I've read reports between 1.5 to 3 centimeters a day. This is how fast this stuff grows. Okay, so it's good. it takes over everything, all right? And I work with engineers, so I have to scare them into this. Japanese knotweed can grow through concrete. And we all know, well I know, engineers <laughs> love concrete. Like, I mean, it's their favorite material. It's predictable. You know, they can mold it into whatever they want to do. They can put it anywhere. It seems to solve life's problems, okay? And you can even stick steel into it to make it stronger if you want to. It's fantastic, okay? But so when you tell your engineers who spend hours and hours talking about their coefficients and their weight-bearing capacities, that this plant, this lovely little plant that keeps coming back every year, could potentially knock down their structure, you know, within a couple of years, they start listening to you pronto. And that's when the emails start flooding it. And that's when they start listening to you. So, how does it do this, okay? So it's got this amazing root system like I talked to, talk to you about. It can go two meters down under the ground, down to the water table. It can possibly, if it's really, really well established, grow out seven meters from where the plant is, out seven meters, right? Really, 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 really big. Cutting it, not a great idea. So this, doesn't, this plant doesn't work by seed. It's actually all female plants. So the seeds kind of fall, but nothing really happens. So fragments of this, of this stuff, that's how it grows. So if you have a piece, uh, 0 0.7 grams, I believe, or let's say my fingernail, right, of its root system, or a vital piece of its stem, and that falls on the ground, if you're given the right conditions, in 10 days, that can start growing up again, okay? It's deadly. It's all bad news, guys. All really bad news. <laughs> so, in our apocalyptic movie, we have to combat it, okay? Now, this is also bad news. So we have a couple of ways we can do this. So um, chemical warfare, or herbicide treatment, is one way you can do it. But this takes for ages, because this plant, you shock it with, with um, pesticide, and it just, it seems to react. It's like, no, I'm gonna fight this. And it ends up as, and it just keeps growing again and again. So you've gotta do this over years, okay? You've got, and also, no, also, you've got to time it. So the great thing about this, the really cool thing about this plant, it's also deadly, but in the summertime, okay, it uses all its energy from the root system and to push it as fast as it can up into the sky and grow as many shoots as possible. So all the energy is upward movement. So let's say you spray it in June, July. It's pointless, absolutely pointless, okay? Because it'll just like repel it back up to And it's the root system you want to kill. So in August, September, that's the time. You start to watch it. You have to watch it. Like it's like the gremlins, you know, eating after 12 o'clock or something like that. So you've got, to, you've got to kill it then. Because then when it starts to die, it starts bringing all that energy back into its root system. Because it's trying, trying to get ready to hibernate, you know, for the next year. So it's a really forward-thinking plant. So then you kill it. And then you hope that it kind of has a comedy style. It brings its own poison back into itself and kills itself. Now, repeat five years in a row, okay? Good luck. There's also another problem, is that they love, it loves riverbanks, because it spreads along the riverbank, and then in the winter when it dies back, it leaves all the soil there, and so a flood comes and washes a riverbank away. So, in a riverbank, you can't use some of these pesticides, because you kill everything, you kill the fish. So there's only one pesticide you can use. Now, the annoying thing about that one is that the EU are thinking about banning this pesticide because there's rumours, like scientifically, possibly proven rumours, <laughs> that it's carcinogenic <laughs> and that it kills the bees because you spread it when it's got flowers and the bees go jump on it and then, yeah, so that they die as well. So it brings the bees with it too. So, like, it's all bad news. So, um, digging it out is also a bit difficult because you've got to think, okay, you've got to go two metres deep, right? And I've got to go seven metres out, okay, that's a lot of soil. And, 
you know, talk about landfills sometimes. We don't have landfills, and landfills don't want to take this stuff. Can you imagine it's like giving them a poison chance? No, they don't want it. And they have to put it like five meters under the ground as well. No, nobody wants it. Also, cutting it, the worst idea, as I said, mentioned otherwise as well. So we're in a bit of a pickle, okay? Now, it is kind of bad news in the sense that we're fighting against people who have no idea about the plant, but you guys all do next, so that's okay. <laughs> so you gotta, you got to spread the knowledge. And also, um, you know, we'll see signs. If you look out in the, because I look out, of course, and I see them all everywhere, but there are sometimes signs in the hedgerow that says, do not reach, do not cut. But what happens when you go past a sign that says, you know, do not cut because someone's cut over the knotweed with their strimmer <laughs> and they didn't read the sign. That's when you start to lose faith. But it's not, it's not all about news. So I have to put this, the positive spin on it. People are learning about it, you know, and we are fighting against it. Um, so remember, don't cut it. Uh, places like Clare County Council, go on Clare County Council. They've got this great <laughs> initiative, okay? <laughs> who knew? Who knew? They've got this thing where if you see Japanese knotweed, you like text them. They've got their own app. They are on the ball. Like, this is my dream. Can you imagine? I'd be texting them all the day. I'd be, there'd be road fatalities everywhere, but I tell them exactly where it is. Like this, I would text them all the time. So you can text them and tell you exactly where it is. And now, whether or not they actually do anything is a different story. But you can tell them where it is, okay? So that's what I recommend you do. And you know, you tell Court County Council that. Behind, behind us, um, where it is, and they might or might not do something. Um, and other positive things is as well, they might do something, and then they might hire my company, <laughs> and then I might do something. So guys, if from today you go out, and I want you to Google Japanese not wait, because oh, that's the other thing, I can't bring it into you to show you, because that would be illegal. That's, I, can't, I can't do that. I was gonna draw a picture, but I can't draw, so I'm just, I'm just trying to get your curiosity. Um, so if you start seeing that we're, I apologize, but join the club, spread the words, and together we can defeat the apocalypse. <laughs> Thank you very much.